Well, first of all, thank you so much, Mother, for uh, spending this time with us. It's, it's such a thrill and an honor to be with you here tonight. Well, it's a pleasure, and when I knew what you do, or at least when I heard, I was very, very touched because I think the church absolutely needs folks like you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now, in 1963, you seem to have it all, at least by the world standards. Uh, you were on the fast track to stardom. You were starring in movies with the likes of Montgomery Clift and George Hamilton and, of course, Elvis Presley. Um, studios were waving long-term contracts in your face, um, and uh, you were actually engaged to be married. Um, and then something happened. Can you talk a little bit about what that something was? Well, I guess it, it seems strange when you say engaged to be married because what happened was I really fell in love. And I understood that what I took as love beforehand was not really love because when I visited the Abbey of Regina Laudis, where I am now the first time when I was 19, I had this quickening inside. And so I talked to the abbess, who was a foundress then, and I said to her mother, do you think I might have a vocation? And she looked at me, no, Dolores, don't do this, not now. You go back to Hollywood and do the Hollywood thing. You come back and you have a few times with us um, when you're feeling tired and you need a little resuscitation, but you're not ready to think about that. Well, I tell you, I was so relieved. <laughs> I, I thought, well, this is just a, a passing thing. But then, that was 1959, and as I continued to do films, I did a film on the Francis of Assisi, and then a film about a woman who'd been in a concentration camp. And uh, another great flair, a film called Come Fly With Me. And then my um, very best buddy, Don Robinson, asked me to marry him. And I said, I said, Don, couldn't we just make an, an engagement for about a while and think about it? He said, well, if that's what you want. Uh, well, you know in Hollywood, the minute you do the smallest thing, wham. It was in the papers, it was, you know, and Edith Head was going to make a dress for me. I mean, it was totally on the map. So Don and I went to a party one night, and afterwards we were driving home, and he stopped dead in the middle of the road, and he said, Dolores, you were not at the party tonight. Something else is on your mind. Tell me, just tell me you love me. And I said, Don, I said, you're crazy. We're in the middle of the road. We get killed. And, and he said, no, no, I want to know. And I said, Don, I have to go in and think about this. And when I got back to my apartment, the minute I got inside, I said, I've got to go to the Abbey and really, really come to the bottom line. And I went back again. Well, this time, Lady Abbas didn't throw me out. <laughs> she said, what do you want? You have to tell me what it is you want. Well, after a long in and out with her, it finally came to the point that this is what, this is where love was really calling me. Not that I didn't love Don, but somehow my love for him was caught up in another dimension of love. And when I, when I went back and I told him, he was so mad. Oh, I won't tell you the words. <laughs> but he said, I want you to know that all love relationships don't end at the altar. And I'm going to stay with you. I will be with you and I will help you, which he did. And Don stayed a friend to me all the years of his life. He never married. Um, was there one moment, you know, Paul had his road to Damascus encounter <laughs> and Augustine had his Tola Lege in the mm. garden. Was there one moment that was really a defining moment for you in that discernment process? Well, I went up to the hill where Lady Abbas had planted 
her seed when she first got there and said, I'm going to make this foundation. And they went up to that hill. It was a cold, windy, terrible Connecticut winter day. And I got up there where she had planted this seed. And when I knelt there, I was riveted. I just, I, I just looked at the sky and the, the earth, the, the land, and something in me just knew that's where I belonged. So more than one seed was planted on that yes. spot. Yes, that's a good, it's uh, a good analogy. <laughs> um, an, an article that I believe came out in 1993 in Psychology Today about you um, had among its quotes that in a society that regards Hollywood fame as heaven, we presume that someone who gives it all up must either be crazy, ungrateful, <laughs> or tainted by some terrible scandal. You don't seem any of the above. Um, how do you explain such a countercultural decision to a society that is by and large spiritually uh, hard of hearing, if not deaf? Well, I think that they're missing a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Not that everybody should be a nun or a priest, or I don't mean that, but I think everyone should take the time to follow your heart and to find a way to know what is it that you think makes your life worthwhile. Because God made every human being with a mission. That's what I really believe. Every single person who is conceived has a mission by being, by being formed in the likeness of God. And you say, the likeness of God? Yes, of course. And that likeness comes to us when we love someone. And when you really love someone, there's something inside of you that knows what life is about and knows what it means. I'm sure when your baby was born, you knew what that meant. Absolutely. You obviously were trying to discern God's will when you were considering your vocation, but you've spoken in many uh, instances of also feeling that even your time as an actress in Hollywood was part of God's plan for you. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think that I would be crazy if I didn't know that I was really fortunate beyond words. I mean, when I stood in line with all those kids when I was first going to do this Joan of Lorraine thing that got me my school contract, and then, then I did a play, and the fellow from the studio, if my boyfriend sent my picture, the lousiest picture you could ever imagine, <laughs> to all the studios in town. And Hal Wallace and Paul Nathan liked it. And they sent someone to see the play. And out of that, I was sitting in class, drama. It was a, um, um, no, it was a, a, a charm class in Marymount. And we were there, and the, the girl came in and said, Mother, um, Paramount Studios is on the phone for you. And I said, oh, this is one of my friends again playing a joke on me. So I went and I picked up the phone and I said, hi, you playing a joke on me? And you said, no, Miss Hart, your mother thought the same thing. We just talked to her and we had a hard time convincing her that we were real because since you're underage, we have to have her permission to ask you to come in to make a screen test. Well, I was, I was dumbfounded. And, I mean, how, how would that happen to me? There was a lot of really beautiful girls in Hollywood at that time. Really, kids who could sing and dance, who had, all, and had it all ready. And God gave that to me. And I say, Mr. Wallace gave that to me. But I'm sure he had some help. <laughs> Now, even before you broke into the film industry as a profession, uh, you seem to have some personal connections to the industry. Um, you lived for a, a while in Beverly Hills. Your father was an actor. 
Um, you said when you moved to Chicago to live with your grandparents, your granddad was a projectionist yes. at a movie house. Yes. Um, and you, I, I've seen some quotes that you said you always wanted to be part of that world, I would assume meaning the world of movies. What was the early attraction to movies? Well, I mean, I was a seven-year-old kid and I, somebody gave me the book Eleanor Adusa. <laughs> I couldn't read the, the Italian. <laughs> but someone read to me what she did. I was, I was really knocked out because apparently she went to her mother's funeral and observed what her feelings were so she would know when she grew up how to act that kind of sorrow. I thought, boy, that's beyond my skin. <laughs> but I did know, I did know, even at that young age, I wanted to be an actress. And so I began keeping, because she kept all of her notes, all of her friends, her addresses, all everything that happened, she kept a diary. So I started mine. Well, I guess you can take the girl out of Hollywood, but you can't completely take Hollywood out of the girl. And um, what I find so fascinating is that you still have a, um, a some sort of an emotional connection to the film industry. I know that uh, in uh, I was watching the uh, HBO documentary that was also nominated for an Oscar, I believe, uh, in 2012. Yes. Um, about your spiritual journey, um, that you still, on occasion, answer fan mail, and that uh, you're still, I believe, the only nun who is a voting member of the Academy yes. and votes for the Oscars. Uh, you walk the red carpet, I think the first time since you had in 1959. And what I find so refreshing, particularly about from someone who you know, uh, has such a love for cinema myself, um, that unlike many Catholics who have somewhat of an understandable um, apprehension about the film industry and sometimes see it as the enemy, you don't seem to have any of that antagonistic view towards Hollywood um, or films in general. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? I guess I always had the belief that Hollywood's job was to show what was happening in the culture. They didn't make up the stories. They found the stories in real living people who had, the same, who had problems. The evil spirit is everywhere. And wherever there's something good, you know the devil is going to want it to have a part. And I've always felt, especially because Hollywood was so good to me, that its role was to show something of the world of the incarnation and to make that incarnation visible. I mean, who could possibly say that they could show the whole world a particular picture about something like Les Miserables. Who could, who could, and yet billions of people saw that. Absolutely, it was a wonderful film. It was, it was my top film of last year. It was an absolutely- Mine too, mine uh, too. Masterpiece, um, and, and you know, often when I, th when I see films that handle um, even the darkest aspects of humanity in a very tasteful and sensitive way, I always call to mind the, the line, I believe, of St. Augustine who said, Lord, let nothing that is human be foreign to me. Um, that, you know, the entire experience of humanity should be um, able to be explored through art in a very tasteful and respectful yes. way. Yes, what a wonderful thought. That's perfect. Um, unfortunately, as a film critic, uh, myself and my co-host often see uh, the trend in Hollywood to um, portray human sexuality uh, in a very um, irresponsible, uh, uh, dehumanizing and, and um, distorted way that sort of strips it of its, of its sacred dignity. Um, in, in watching the documentary about you, um, one thing that stuck with me is that early on you, you sort of had a conflicted view of working in film as a Catholic. You felt that there was the danger of possibly putting you in the near occasion of sin. And I believe it was um, your, your mother superior who made a very interesting observation to you about human sexuality. And so could you talk a little bit about that? And then part B of that question, if you had an opportunity to speak to a, your filmmakers, what advice would you give them about handling human sexuality in, in an authentic and a beautiful way? Well, I believe um, it was one of my priests who told me 
that if I stayed in films, it would be an occasion of sin for me. And so I said to, to um, Lady Abbas, who, was, who is French and American, so she has both cultures in her, and I told her, I said, please help me with this because I don't want to do something that's going to be essentially the, the wrong thing to do. And she said, no way, Dolores. She said, relationships with boys, with men, if they are love relationships, if they are good, it's not sinful. It's awakening a sexual drive in you to become in communion with them. And she said, you don't have to go off in a corner with all of the, the men that you work with on the stage or on films. And I said, well, hardly, Mother. There's a million people and you couldn't <laughs> find a corner. I said, but it's, it's ridiculous, really, to think that's going to be the occasion of sin. What becomes the occasion of sin is when you take that goodness and bring it down to something that is a drive that's disordered. And everyone knows so, somewhere in your heart, if you, if you really look, you know when you're going just... Uh, so we're all very shrewd when we want to be. And if you could share those thoughts with the filmmaker, what, what advice would you give them as far as dealing with uh, human relationships and uh, through the art of, of film. Is, is there any observations that you would make? Well, I think all the films that have really touched us, you know, the Humphrey Bogart and um, uh, Ingrid Bergman, you remember that? Casablanca. Uh, Casablanca. All those wonderful films from the years through that have really touched us have been films that really touched the human desire to love and the passionate need that men and women have for one another who truly fall in love. And when you take that gift and trash it and turn it into a one night stand, you're doing something that is, it's really unfair to God's creation because he didn't make us for that. That's beautiful. The film you reference, uh, of course, Casablanca, was directed by Michael Curtiz, who yes. also directed you in oh. <laughs> uh, King Creole. Yes, Michael. What I found fascinating is that I, I learned that you actually converted to Catholicism at age 10. Is that true? And could you speak a little bit about um, that decision? Well, I went to school at the uh, Catholic school because my grandmother, whom I lived with at the time, was afraid to send me to school where I would have to cross the railroad tracks. So I got into the Catholic school as a little Protestant. Actually, I was a little atheist kid. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other children, because in those days you had to fast until midnight. So all the other children had sweet rolls and chocolate <laughs> milk after the mass. And I had my breakfast at home. And I was looking at them one day and I said to the sister, Oh, boy, I would really love to have the bread with the children. Well, she thought I meant the bread at the altar. So she went to the priest and said, I think little Dolores really would like to be a Catholic. I think we should let her have a chance. And the father said, well, of course. I mean, you know, that's... So she said to me, if you want to come to the school's Catholic classes, we could talk about the bread. And I said, oh, great. So I, I went home and I said to my grandmother, I can have sweet rolls of milk with the kids if I go to church and I go to the, the classes on religion. And she said, well, do you want to go to the classes on religion? She was, you know, do unto others as they will do unto you, kid. <laughs> and I said, yes, I would. And she, she was a very modern grandmother. She said, sure. She said, if you want to do it, go ahead. If you like it, do it. You know? <laughs> it was a very fortuitous misunderstanding there, I guess. Yes. The yes. way to the heart is through the stomach, apparently so is the way to the soul. <laughs> the Lord knew what he was doing when he <laughs> went that direction, believe me. <laughs> now, you had mentioned um, the founder of your community, Mother Benedict um, Duss, and uh, much like you, she 
also gave up a very promising career. In her case, it was medicine. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Roughly around the same age, in your early 20s, yes. mm -hmm. to uh, take vows. Uh, one story that I heard is that uh, after you, I guess, had made your uh, discernment and decided to take uh, vows, you had told her that you were done with acting, uh, and that was behind you, to which she said that you were wrong, that now you had to take up a new role um, and work it really hard, the, the role of, of being a nun. Um, and you also once said that being a nun is being an actress. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, Mother Abbess was always a doctor with us. She always used the things that made her profession most valuable. It always came to the fore. And I think that what she was driving at is that an actress, in order to really perform your craft well, you have to listen. You have to listen to the role you're playing, you have to listen to the other actors, and you have to listen to what's going on. Because any actor who goes in there, and it's all me, and I'm blah, blah, it ends it. If you listen, you allow a real performance to happen. And I think that the, um, I've never asked her about it, but I presumed she might be thinking about the rule of St. Benedict, because the first lines of his rule are, Asculta, O Fili, listen, my son or my daughter, to the voice of the Master. And that, I think, is what she was driving at, is that to be a nun, you also have to learn to listen. I guess all good acting is reacting. And exactly, <laughs> exactly. While filming Francis of Assisi in 1961, I believe, in which mm -hmm. you played St. Clair, yes. uh, you had a very providential encounter with Pope John XXIII. Yes. Um, <laughs> can you please share that story with us? Well, well a friend of mine um, was um, a Monsignor there, Monsignor Carew, and he said, now when we go in, I will signal you and we will go up and I know we can have a moment with the Holy Father. Well, when he came in, they carried him in, you know, on the, I don't remember what you call it, but his shoe fell off. <laughs> and the shoe tumbled down underneath the carrier. So the guard got down on his hands and knees and was looking, well, the Holy Father was hysterical. He just laughed. And of course, when that fellow laughed, he just rolled, you know. <laughs> he was having such a good time. Well, at that point, Monsignor Carew said to me, come on, that's our entrance. <laughs> so we, we ran up to him. And when he looked at me, he said, oh, Chiara. And I said, oh, um, no, Your Excellency, my name is Dolores. And he said, no, 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 for you is Chiara. And I said, and then I thought, oh, he's talking about St. Clair. And I said, oh, you mean St. Clair? And he says, good. He says, that is your vocation. Wow. And I changed the subject as fast <laughs> as I could. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful story. Speaking of another Holy Father, Blessed John Paul II, um, truly believed that movies were more than mere entertainment. Mm. Um, on many occasions he spoke about movies being powerful influencers of ideas, attitudes, and values. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that um, the church should have a voice in the pop cultural conversation? And, and about movies in particular, because I believe they're such a, an important part of the masses media diet, um, do you believe that the church should um, dialogue with uh, pop culture, particularly given the mission of the new evangelization? I think that's where the church belongs, because the church belongs where everywhere that someone is talking about the reality of truth, the reality of why. Why are we created? What's the purpose? What's your dignity? Who are you? What's your vocation? All of those questions come up, and the church belongs at the heart of that question. 
I think if the church pulls away from movies because they have a, again, the one fellow who told me, watch out for your vocation because it might be no way. I think a, a program like this, for example, belongs in the church and with the people. During the recent conclave, um, both believers and not were somehow drawn to the TV set and news coverage. Um, and I wonder if you feel that that speaks to a deep thirst for God, or at least spirituality, transcendence, something bigger than the self. And I wonder if uh, particularly the, the response to our new Holy Father, Pope Francis's mm -hmm. personality mm -hmm. and humility really s indicates that maybe we're hardwired for holiness. I think that's a wonderful way of saying it because the Lord said, let them be one. He wasn't talking about himself and the 12 apostles as much as he was talking about us, that we are to be one people. And how else are we going to be one people until we start seeing the culture of one another, seeing the problems that one another lives through, understanding persons of a different language, understanding the accent of someone who, the gentleman who put on my, um, what you say, microphone. The, my microphone here, he comes from a different place. I could tell from his accent. And I wanted to say, where are you from? Who are your people? Why are you here? What, what happens in the body when we allow it to stay sacred and good is such a beautiful and wonderful thing. That's why you say, what's, what is the problem of abortion? The problem of abortion, all those bodies are lost and don't have an opportunity to express themselves to know themselves, to find out why they're living. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful life if we can really find the living, loving people that are worth sharing it with. I had said that in the eyes of the world you had seen that you had everything, the fame, the fortune, the, all the worldly ingredients of a happy life. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to sort of paraphrase St. John of the Cross, he uses the metaphor of these deep cisterns in the heart mm -hmm. to, dis to describe the inadequacy of all that to ultimately fulfill mm -hmm. our deepest desires. And it it's predates him. It goes back to Augustine with our hearts are restless until they rest in God. And um, I think Fulton Sheen put it that uh, our, our, what our hearts desire is something as deep as the ocean, and we look for it in teacups. Um, yes. Can, can, looking back over the whole trajectory of your life, can you sort of sum up that, that sense of longing and looking and then ultimately finding? Well, you see, when I was maybe I was 23, 22, or earlier than that, my father had met a young man in, in New York who was a singer. His name was Johnny Cocosa and he introduced my aunt to him, and they got married. And they all went to Hollywood, where he became Mario Lanza. Oh. And I grew up loving and living with his, his children, and sometimes taking care of them when the family wasn't there. And I went through the death of both my uncle and my aunt, and saw what, uh, a violence that, well, the same has happened to Elvis. When somebody uses a person who is that big for money and for their own values, I could not believe it when they brought Mario back after carting him all over the world in the coffin and looking at that wreck of a face and saying, why? Why does fame and fortune do this to a, a, a brilliant performer, a brilliant person? Because somewhere, somewhere you've got to understand, 
it's a, fame is a wonderful thing, but when it runs your life and when it runs the people who are running you, you can lose perspective. You lose what the real issue, the real meaning of your life is. And no matter how much money you have, no matter how many beautiful, beautiful homes, I remember looking at Mario's home with a Christmas tree that was four stories high in the living room. Why? Nobody even could get to the presents inside. <laughs> I mean, and that, that's an absurd single example, but the principle is the same. The gift that you put under the tree is a gift of the Christ child. And the Christ child always has to be the simplicity of the birth of love in your life, however that comes, however you, you find it. For me, it was becoming a contemplative. And I have found in my community the most wonderful and joyful peace that I could ever ask for. I've seen a lot of hardship. I've seen many, many things come and go, but you're glad they went. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, Mother, when you walked the red carpet uh, two years ago at the Academy Awards for the Oscar-nominated documentary, um, what was the reaction of the crowd? I would assume that there, were, there would be celebrities there who would be just as starstruck um, about you as, as other people are about top celebrities today. Actually, when I walked on the, the, the carpet and I went through the tunnel there to get into where everything was at, on the one side, there were nothing but cameras, just lines and lines of cameras, I guess from every country in the world. And on the other side, it's just thousands of kids on the bleachers, just, hi, hi. And so I thought, what am I going to do? How can I respond to them? What can I say? And then I said, well, <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> and so did I. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> well, as I said, you do maintain a certain degree of connection to the film industry. So I ask you, have you seen any good movies lately? Well, the ones that I loved this year were Les Miserables. That was my, that was my, I guess I'm not supposed to say what you check oh, as uh, a voter. Sure. I won't tell anybody. I, I think it was one of the most Catholic films in recent memory as well. I, I agree. And when anyone ever says that, uh, you know, Hollywood is anti-Catholic, you could point to a movie like that and say occasionally, occasionally they get it right and they, they get, get it right in a really great way. And with the big stars they used. Oh, absolutely. It was brilliant and very moving and very, very um, holy. I think you said it Oh, first. it was some really, some moments that bordered mm -hmm. on the transcendent and mm -hmm. there were some really grace-filled moments. And I think they added... Uh, or they emphasized a lot of the religious as, uh, elements of the book of Victor Hugo's novel mm -hmm. that were downplayed in even the stage production. Yes. Well, I have one last question for you. If you were on a desert island and you could only take one movie with you and King Creole was not available, <laughs> <laughs> which movie would it be? Well, I loved Al Magnani okay. in The Rose Tattoo. The Rose Tattoo. And I thought that was the most unbelievably earthy and lovely performance. So when I actually had the chance to play with her, that's when I really knew that God had chosen. <laughs> <laughs> because she took one look at me and, and she said, no, 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 she's not, not Italian. Her eyes are blue. You know, oh, oh, oh. And the director, who was a darling man, he said, give a chance. And he said to me, learn Italian <laughs> in six hours and learn to play it with her. And I said, don't tell me you can't. And so we got on the, we got on the stage. I mean, yeah, they're not the stage together. We went through that scene. Eight hours we were working on it. Wow. And in those days you did that kind of thing. And it was I think worth every acting class I ever went to. 
Well, it proves that with God, all things are certainly possible. They are indeed. Well, Mother, uh, in 1958, as you were discerning your vocation, I believe you appeared in a Broadway show called In the Pleasure of His Company. Yes, indeed. And I would like to thank you for the pleasure of your company uh, wow. these past uh, few moments that you've been able to share with us. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure and an honor. Well, for me, this was a grace, and I'm so grateful that my mo mother superior and my, my community sent me down to be with you because they said, remember, we're with you. So you're not only talking to me, you're talking to 38 of us. And now all our viewers, and I'm sure they're all grateful as well. Thank you very Thank much. You.